thank you uh, all for being here. Thank you, Phil, for the invitation, and uh, great to be here at the Oxford Internet Institute. As Phil mentioned, most of my career has been uh, studying the relationship between uh, race and politics, primarily electoral politics, so campaigns, uh, elections within the context of U.S. Uh, politics and issues around messaging and imagery and the ways that racial messages get constituted, interpreted, and how they uh, impact people's attitudes and uh, behaviors. Um, it was about uh, probably five, five to seven years now that my work began to transition into uh, looking at the digital media environment and the internet and trying to uh, understand what was going on uh, there and what my interests uh, might be there in this, uh, what was then very uh, kind of a new context in terms of uh, an area of study uh, for me. I think I'm going to position myself because the way we have this, I don't get the screen on my screen. So <clears throat> just so I can see a bit and don't get too lost. So what I want to do today is to <clears throat> Uh, give you a sort of a highlight, a kind of overview of my current book project, which is called Black Software, The Internet and Racial Justice from the Afronet to Black Lives Matter. Uh, and so rather than get you sort of uh, deep into the nitty gritty, what I want to do is kind of give you an overview of the overarching narrative and kind of the pathway that I took both into uh, this project from its beginning and how that's shaped up and kind of uh, uh, come to fruition in the past or uh, in the present uh, as I've been uh, writing. So what I'm going to do, I think, is <clears throat> I'm going to start here and give you basically four premises that undergird uh, this project and my work. Uh, and I do this typically uh, for, for two reasons. Number one, if you feel like uh, after five minutes you've had enough and you walk out, You've gotten it, <clears throat> so that's all good. Um, uh, but also to give you a sense of kind of framing, uh, and particularly since many of the aspects I'll draw your attention to, I won't go into uh, great detail. This gives you a little bit of framing and certainly look forward to coming back uh, at the time of discussion and answering questions or going into any more detail uh, that you might uh, like. So let's start with the first premise, and that is that black people have a historical, multidimensional relationship to the internet and computing. And I would say if there's any one important uh, premise here, this is it. Uh, when we look at the history of both civil rights, when we look at the history of computing, when we look at uh, the history of the, of the internet in terms of both its invention, uh, its development, its use, uh, black people, African Americans in particular, are relatively invisible. Um, and so typically where we see or hear black people in the context of the internet is a uh, kind of term I'm sure you're all uh, familiar with called the digital divide, right? The idea that uh, when the internet came online and several years after it, there was a sharp divide in terms of access, in terms of use that fell along racial uh, as well as socioeconomic and other uh, lines. But that typically is the entry point and the primary and only entry point when we think about this relationship between uh, African Americans, black people in general, and uh, the internet. And so <clears throat> the premise running throughout the book is essentially that everything that we might talk about in our contemporary moment uh, with respect to social movements, to racial justice activism, as it relates to computing, as it relates to the internet, must be framed oh, let's see. Hmm. I have a feeling that's going to keep happening. <clears throat> must be framed uh, by this uh, point here, that is, uh, thinking about an overarching relationship. The second, whether the internet can and will continue to facilitate revolutionary racial justice activism is directly tied to this relationship, and so some ways not quite uh, 
uh, deterministic, and we'll talk about this later, uh, there is a way in which this relationship uh, constrains and sets forth the boundaries or limits of uh, racial justice activism. Digital optimism and pessimism run currently, concurrently throughout this history. So that's much of what uh, the narrative I'll be taking you through uh, kind of shows at the same moments, kernels of optimism uh, and also a deep pessimism. And then at least uh, today, maybe this will change by the time the book is out, I somehow doubt it, but um, that the strand of digital pessimism runs particularly uh, strong, it is deep and uh, constraining. So those are uh, the four takeaways. And what I want to do over the next few minutes, and if someone will help me at about a quarter till, no matter where I am, I want to stop for Q&A because I could continue on and on and on. So I want to talk to you about uh, some connected revolutions and then talk about a group of black entrepreneurs um, from uh, the, the early uh, days of the web's uh, history. Talk about some formative early networks of African Americans uh, connecting uh, uh, via computers and what may be a sort of precursor to the internet that we uh, now know. And then talk about uh, a group uh, and a phenomenon that I called systems uh, engineering. And so systems engineering being both a uh, an actual job title, uh, but also a way of thinking about uh, this relationship between computing and race. So I want to start in 1965. Um, and I think this is not just a pivotal moment, but a foundational moment in this particular historical trajectory, both in terms of the history of computing as well as the history of civil rights. Uh, I'm going to read this small section. I'll warn you that this will only be a small section and I won't uh, read anything else the rest of the evening. Um, but to set the stage of this moment, particularly for many of you that may not be uh, uh, familiar with uh, U.S. history, civil rights history, uh, particularly this moment in the mid-1960s. <coughs> it was fall and Watts still simmered. Near 50 years of Negro silence had stripped away its very soul. Tired, as one man put it, of being pushed around by you white people, Watts finally woke. The sprawling urban community that had confined three quarters of Los Angeles' black residents spoke for six long, sweltering August days in 1965. Its collective voice reverberated amidst a cacophonous torrent of rocks and gunfire broken windows and Molotov cocktails. As one giant clinched and raised black fist, Watts rose. It became a towering national beacon for a newfound black power. But by the time the LAPD, the Los Angeles Police Department, and 14,000 National Guardsmen ended their six-day, 54-square-block siege, 34 souls, all of them black, lay bloodied and still. Another thousand nursed injuries while 4,000 shuffled their way, handcuffed through police car and jail cell revolving doors. $40 million worth of buildings, businesses, automobiles, and other neighborhood property smoldered in ashes. White Los Angeles searched for explanations. The more parochial and paternalistic among them thought their blacks had it better than any in the country, especially compared to the South. They were caught off guard by the sudden challenge and needed answers, and so public officials, professors, and newsmen produced many such explanations to exploit the American public's rapt attention. examines the question of Watts. Was it a local riot or the beginning of a national revolt? What started it? What stopped it? Will there be another Watts? John McCone has just presented Governor Edmund Brown of California his investigating committee's report seeking the answers to just such questions. 
These findings are an integral part of what follows, a CBS report study of the principal events and causes of the nightmare in Watts. <laughs> International Business Machines, IBM presents CBS Reports. Watts, Riot or Revolt. Now, here is CBS News correspondent Bill Stump, who has covered the Watts story from the moment the rioting began. So in many ways, IBM quite literally brought the revolution to the attention of the American public, at least this particular moment. Uh, and what we know and what is significant about 1965 and about the Watts riots was that it was not, of course, a singular event. Riots preceded it. And in the year and a half or so following, uh, American cities uh, across the country from coast to coast and small uh, towns and large cities erupted in similar sorts of ways. And so IBM's sponsorship of this particular documentary is uh, significant not because, uh, or not only because of its sponsorship of a, uh, what was then a very new and novel television news format, but it is, I think, significant because of what it suggests in terms of a, uh, a message, in terms of framing, and what ends up being a very clear roadmap or a set of prognostications about a, uh, a historical traje tra trajectory that is beginning to be developed in that moment as these two lines cross, that is, civil rights history and actions in 1965 and the birth of computing. But I want to jump about 50 years uh, to the present moment and where my uh, project started, and we'll work our way back to uh, 1965 as the presentation comes to a close. And so I want to draw your attention to uh, another revolutionary moment that many of you are far probably familiar with, known as Black Lives Matter. And I want to point out uh, just a few things and not uh, belabor uh, too much. Um, that is, Black Lives Matter, in many ways, was a revolutionary moment, a revolutionary movement. Uh, if nothing else, uh, it did something that uh, no one had accomplished in the U.S. since 1972, and that was to firmly place race, racial issues, racial discrimination at the top of the U.S. <coughs> uh, political and social agenda. And so not since 1972, when uh, pollsters and others asked the American public what's the most pressing uh, problem in the nation or facing the nation, uh, not since 1972 had people said race relations or race or anything uh, close to that. And since, uh, and in these moments in the rise of Black Lives Matter and since, that has uh, changed. And it has changed in a substantial way that has persisted for uh, now several years in terms of uh, that being at the forefront of people's minds. And so there are many things that we could talk about in terms of impact, uh, but we'll just raise uh, that one as one. It was also significant because what we know about the success of Black Lives Matter was that it was both, uh, it both originated and began largely uh, because of a new generation of citizens, a new generation of activists. It's a new generation who uh, were willing to push the boundaries of what organizing and what activism looked like, particularly within uh, the U.S. civil rights landscape. They were willing to push the boundaries and think about leadership differently and think about leadership much more in a kind of networked way rather than a hierarchical uh, format in which it had existed uh, prior. And then, of course, as shown in this image here, uh, it was significant and Black Lives Matter success tied greatly to a new generation's facility with ability to mobilize new digital tools and the internet, particularly platforms like Twitter, Facebook, uh, the open web, and many others to uh, amplify their message, to organize in very specific ways, and to do so both uh, broadly, but also doing so very specifically, that is, um, curtailing and defining who the movement was for and about, 
and defining membership and who's included in that. And so what I mean is that certain activists that used open platforms but said, this is for black people. When we try to organize people to come to Ferguson, we mean only African Americans that we want there. And here is the boundaries of your participation, both digitally and on the ground in Ferguson. And then finally, uh, some sophisticated ways in which networks were formed uh, within these varying platforms. And so this is just a snapshot from a, uh, a study that uh, a colleague, Dean Freelon, uh, masterminded and that myself and a colleague, Meredith Clark, uh, assisted with. And this image, is, this image just shows one of many of the network formation within Twitter that helped to amplify much of Black Lives Matter uh, their work uh, and their message. Um, and if you looked at this uh, in the report, which is called, um, uh, I forgot the name of the report. So you can find it if you just plug in my name or Dean Freelon. Um, but what it shows is very much a sort of complex web of relationships that include uh, Black Lives Matter activists and is very important in some ways because throughout the movement, uh, this activity has been led uh, and framed by uh, black people and by Black Lives Matter activists uh, in particular. And so the message that has gone forth has largely been shaped by, framed uh, very consistently and very narrowly in terms of both the interest and participation in ways that uh, had not been uh, done prior and had not been done when we look at uh, other forms of message circulation within uh, news outlets and other forms of uh, information circulation. And so this is where my project uh, began. And of course, the, the news media at the very beginning looked at Black Lives Matter and their success and said, this is a new civil rights movement, right? And this is something that we've never seen before. And almost any time someone says something is new, my hackles kind of go up. Nothing is ever new, right? And so it struck me almost immediately that not only was this not new in the sort of historical trajectory about civil rights, uh, there are certainly some things that were different, but not wholly new. But it also, I suspected that it wasn't completely new in terms of the use of digital tools and the use of uh, the internet, which is really what uh, news media and others focused in on at the very beginning. The fact that here was this new digital movement. This was a new internet civil rights movement. And that's what, in many ways, made it new. And so I began to question and I began to then look back a bit. That is, where did Black Lives Matter come from? It didn't come out of just nowhere. But many things about it does seem particularly novel, both its participants, the technologies that are used, and certainly its successes. And so as I began to look back, I ended up about 20 years uh, prior, really at the dawn of what we now know as the web, as the internet in its uh, commercial form. And I began to find people and content that while there is no um, direct genealogical relationship, though there may be one there if uh, I or others uh, look specifically for it, there is certainly a foundation in which our present moment uh, was based. And so I wanna just briefly introduce you to uh, a few of them and talk about their significance. Sorry about the, uh, the lack of quality images here. They date from about, uh, 1992 or so. Um, <clears throat> this is uh, Derek Brown. Um, Derek was uh, the founder of what was called uh, the Universal Black Pages. Uh, it opened and uh, was online in 1994. So Derek was a, a student, graduate student at uh, Georgia Institute of Technology, now Georgia Tech. He had come there from Clemson as an electrical engineer, and he was a member, the communications director of the Georgia Tech Black Graduate Student Union. And he and the rest of that group began to uh, 
look around and sort of notice, number one, they are very small in number on the campus of Georgia Tech, being African American engineers. They also began to look around and say, um, we want to be able to connect not just with our peers here at Georgia Tech, we want to be able to connect to our peers elsewhere throughout the country. Those like us at Caltech and at Stanford and at MIT uh, and other places. And so Derek, um, who got his first computer around 1986 or so, I believe, um, and mom you know, spent pretty much every dime she had to get it, uh, and he grew up using that computer to do mainly one thing. He loved databases, and he loved solving problems. And so he ended up using uh, early spreadsheets to, uh, he loved baseball, that's the other part of the story. Uh, so he built basically this uh, massive predictive system uh, with all the baseball stats in order to predict the outcome of baseball games. Uh, and that was what got him into this sort of love of computers, but more generally, the love of helping people solve problems. Um, and so, as he looked on the early web, what he saw was a collection of sites here and there that were about black people, uh, about the black diaspora, that were owned by <coughs> other black people, but they were isolated sites, sites that you could not easily find at that time. And so what he did, uh, and what the primary mission of the universe, uh, Universal Black Pages was, was to connect and make navigable all of these sites. And so at the time, uh, in 94, UBP connected about 2,500, 3,000 black-oriented sites at the time, which um, uh, amounted to about uh, three or four percent of all the existing uh, websites at the time. This is uh, the soul of cyberspace in around 1996, E. David Ellington, who built this site, which was uh, at that time the uh, most visible, the most uh, important, the most highly trafficked, and certainly the most financially lucrative uh, black website uh, that existed. Uh, and Derek was, uh, an interesting guy, had a background as an entertainment uh, attorney in Los Angeles, um, had a friend from way back who worked in Silicon Valley, and at one point said, hey, I want to introduce you to this thing called a CD-ROM, and he looked at it and said, oh, this is kind of neat, and he started using the CD-ROM to, uh, to license images and so forth for his clients and write that into their contracts. Uh, a little later on, he said, I want to introduce you to this thing called the internet. And of course, like everyone else at the time, he said, what is this? And what is it for? And who needs it? And who uses it? But very quickly decided he knew what this was for. He knew what people would be attracted to this thing. And he said, everyone loves black content. Everyone loves the kind of people that I've been representing all of my career, entertainment, uh, entertainers, artists, musicians, and others. Uh, and so he came up with the idea to marry this new technology with his love and facility with black content, particularly black entertainment content, and came up with uh, Net Noir, which was both a content uh, generation uh, space, but also an early community for, uh, for black uh, people to congregate. This is Lee Bailey, who began the uh, Electronic Urban uh, Report. Um, Bailey, too, was from Los Angeles, a former DJ, a former uh, Army veteran, and had an advertising, radio advertising business before he began uh, EUR Web. And so this particular website he did as a transition uh, from his old work on radio into his, uh, the new platforms as they were coming online. And so this began uh, as an email uh, mailing list and then flipped into a website to bring that audience from radio, from email, uh, to a site that really featured uh, everything about black entertainment. And uh, he had this interesting word he told, he'd, he'd talk about and say, uh, you know, I'm interested in serious stuff and, 
uh, serious news about race and about black people, but people don't listen to that. Uh, black people and no, uh, no one other. Um, and so he said, I'm interested in and in feature what he called the scuzz. Has anyone ever heard that term before? You've heard of it? Okay, I'd never heard of it. It's essentially the gossip, uh, you know, the latest thing about this celebrity and that, the word on the street. And that's what he built uh, this site around in terms of uh, content. Um, I'm going to skip very quickly to a few other uh, folks because there are many. Uh, Anita Brown um, was a pioneer that was very much unlike the others. Uh, she was a woman. Uh, she was over 50 when she began her site, Black Geeks Online. Um, and word had it that she essentially uh, had built a mailing list of 25,000 uh, African Americans from across the country and otherwise, and essentially had become the connecting point uh, for the most diverse group of African Americans in the country uh, online. And so she parlayed her work both in terms of gathering other people like her and facilitating their community and conversation, uh, but she was the uh, the first and really the only of these entrepreneurs that began to kind of push her interest into the world of organizing. And so much of what she did was to gather people together and then use that to try to push uh, activism around racial issues, but also activism in terms of uh, getting black people online. Um, and so this was a moment where uh, that wasn't happening in, in large, uh, uh, to a large degree. And so she made that part of her work. Faraya Chidea, many of you may be familiar with her. She writes today for the, uh, the popular blog, uh, 538. Um, but she is a sort of interesting connecting point between what we might consider uh, the old internet and uh, the new. Uh, Chidea is a, a journalist. She has parents who are also journalists. When she graduated uh, from Harvard, I believe, in around 1994, uh, she was one of the first uh, to begin making money as a freelance journalist, essentially, uh, online, and built this site, Pop and Politics, uh, <coughs> that was featured around uh, largely content, popular content, uh, popular culture issues uh, that had something to do with uh, race, uh, and then also spent a lot of her time within uh, the, the sphere of electoral uh, politics. And so Chidea was both a part of many of the uh, other new, primarily black-oriented uh, community sites that began to spring up, spring up uh, in the early uh, mid-90s. Um, she was a part of The Well, uh, if any of you are familiar with that, the Whole Earth Electronic Network, an early place where we got our uh, uh, name for uh, virtual community. Um, etc. So she was part of that sort of uh, tail end of the old and continuing and connecting uh, part of what we know as uh, the new. And then uh, Barry Cooper, who I'll wait and talk about uh, a little bit more in Q&A if we uh, want to, but he built Black Voices. You know it now in the uh, articulation as Huffington Post, Black Voices, and there's a long sort of line and continuation around uh, acquisitions and mergers and so forth that landed this site that began uh, in uh, late 1997 that he built on a shoestring in Florida, sold to the Chicago Tribune, then later to uh, America Online, and so on and so forth. As I sort of ended, uh, as it were, my discussion kind of interface with that particular group, a group of entrepreneurs. Um, and they all, uh, they all shared a common uh, agenda. Um, and most of that was to connect to other black people. For many of them, it was to make money. Uh, for very few of them, uh, it was a kind of a mission to do explicitly uh, sort of activist work or what we might think of as activist work. They were focused on how do we connect black people to informa information about ourselves, to resources that would fuel uh, our interests, uh, 
um, and ways that would continue a sense of uh, connection and forge a sense of connection and uh, solidarity. The other thing that they had in common was, of course, by about uh, the end of the 90s, they were all gone. Um, most of them were either bought or those who began them did not have the uh, ability to sustain them. Uh, and essentially, they all disappeared. Uh, and one, if one looks out on the landscape of the internet today, uh, one would be hard pressed to find similar sites that are black owned, that feature black content, uh, and do so in the ways that these uh, pioneers uh, had. I'm running quickly out of time, so I'm going to um, hurry to talking about uh, 1986. Uh, and a time I discovered where networking was happening amongst black people before what we know as the internet. And that was through uh, what was called the Afronet. Afronet was um, part of the bulletin board system that was, uh, began in the late 70s, became really popular early mid 80s. Uh, and essentially what the Afronet was, <coughs> was a network of bulletin board systems owned and operated by black, uh, they called themselves SysOps, system operators. So they owned the machinery, they owned the hardware, they owned the software, and they made their computer systems uh, open for connection and facilitated connection from people across the country, from west coast to east and up through uh, Canada. Um, and you can see some of the names of the boards, many of them that uh, represent uh, very clearly uh, racial issues, African-American um, uh, groups, so on and so forth. Um, but the interesting thing about this network was that it was, uh, it was all black and it was very heavily policed. That is, to gain entrance, to connect to the network, to any hub, one had to tell your sort of racial, your black uh, bona fides, if, as it were. Uh, and they did that in a variety of ways. Most often was uh, that gatherings of people that belonged to a local board would simply meet uh, in local communities. And so even as they were working mostly uh, and connecting through the community or through the computer, they would often meet in local areas and that would help sort of facilitate connection, but it also helped facilitate membership and making sure people met the, uh, the criteria. These were people like uh, Wayne Hicks, uh, like Idette Vaughn uh, in Brooklyn. They were everyday people. They were firemen. They were cops. They were teachers. They were hobbyists. They were people who just liked um, the new technology. They liked uh, connecting. And they really liked the ability to connect to other black people uh, across geographical spaces, something that they heretofore uh, at that point could uh, never do. Um, this group was short-lived. It also had a death right around uh, the same time uh, as the others, actually a little bit earlier. Um, that is, they got swallowed up when the web emerged. Uh, there was no reason to police in this way. Uh, the service that they provided in terms of connection was taken over by uh, large uh, internet service providers. Uh, and there was no reason then for them to exist. And what's interesting about many of them as I talk to them is that as the web uh, evolved, they stopped. <laughs> they did not continue. They gave it up. Um, and so one of the folks that I, I spoke with uh, quite a bit um, said, you know, number one, I was always in this for the fun of it from the get-go. Uh, and it got to the time where it made no more sense. And at the end, I kind of calculated up and I'd started it sort of to make money. But I found out that over the years, I had been in the hole about 25 grand. And if I had it all over to do again, I would do the same thing. I simply had the interest of connecting people um, and connecting, being connected to this uh, larger group. Quickly, I want to take you back to um, 1978. Um, as I started this, this other work, somewhere in there, um, I got pushed back further and further in history and largely because of this man, William Morell. Um, 
William Morrell um, was the person where uh, the title of my book comes from, uh, Black Software. Uh, it was on his uh, site where I first saw the term and was sort of <coughs> interested in the concept. Uh, and from everything I could tell from the web, um, I decided and waited for quite a bit before I called Morel because I had the feeling that I could go anywhere with what this guy seemed to be from his sort of uh, digital, his web footprint. Um, but essentially I called him up, we talked, and we ended up talking quite a few times uh, since then. But our conversation, our first conversation opened with a very uh, benign question that I opened all of my conversation with with the folks that I had interviewed and that was simply when did you first go online um, and all of them to a T you know I you know expected you know early 2000s I expected the 90s William said ah, you know about 1978 and so there was a pause and I said tell me about you being online and what that meant in 19 78. Um, and here's a little bit that we talked about. I was only three miles away, but really, I worked for Livingstone, so I spent most of my time working. Even though that's on your screen. Sorry for the typo. But see, the PC, the other PC, Dr. Mark Bing, that after the American Civil War, who was in the Civil War, and was a architect for Harvard University, he did have a in Charlotte. I remember going to the sort of building that there was not even a building with no name on it. There were cubicles with, with no name on it. It was top secret, whatever. And they said, don't talk about this. <laughs> whatever you think, don't talk about the outside world. <laughs> but, but, you know, we, we were IBM's technical force. So no matter where the problems were, whether it was at a customer site or at our own office, we were both well, pixel. So I distinctly remember going to this, this quick gray building where I believe that's an effort the PC was actually launched by marketing. That somewhere in the literature I saw that uh, Dr. Mark Dean was clearly uh, present and uh, uh, responsible for the architecture of uh, major parts of the IBM PC uh, unit. And uh, the other thing I asked William because he happened to. Uh, grow up in the city in which I was born. In fact, we figured out we lived about a half a mile from each other. Um, is, I said, you know, I know this city, you must have been an anomaly at IBM being African American in 1978 through the early 80s. And he said, nope. My manager, uh, the division manager, many of the folks uh, that work with him, both uh, at his level and above, uh, were African American. Uh, and so we talked much um, about them, but part of the significance and reason I bring up uh, William is that he personified in a way uh, what was a kind of two-tracked uh, system both at IBM but also larger in a larger sense with respect to um, computing um, and computing uh, employment um, and education. And that is he was a systems engineer which was a fancy term at the time at IBM for what we'd now just call tech support, right? They were the ones most closely connected to their clients. Uh, and so when clients had a question about how the, uh, to work the machine or the outputs were not coming out correctly, they would contact the system engineer and they would do so largely in a connected networked uh, environment uh, to do so. Um, but William had a technical school degree. He had a two-year degree from DeVry Institute. And what I began to find was that there, this was a familiar pathway for black people getting online at that point and beyond. Uh, it was either through places like IBM and other companies where as a technician, they gained entrance and access to hardware, software, critical kinds of knowledge. Uh, the other area that they often were in were in uh, government uh, positions where they also got similar uh, access and knowledge. Um, but this was not the same kind of people that were coming from uh, MIT and from Stanford and others and doing very different things with the machine, with the technology in terms of uh, invention and so forth. And so when you run up against things, uh, as I first did early on, a big encyclopedia of black technology that says, 
Um, from everything that is uh, out there, there's no um, connection to any black people to the formation of the internet. Right? Uh, and that's because folks are looking at inventors which tend to come from a very particular trajectory. I'm going to quickly wrap up um, back in 1965. Uh, it was a time, uh, as I spoke before, when pollsters asked what's the most pressing national uh, issue, uh, civil rights and race relations in 1965, by, uh, by far uh, outweighed everything else. President Johnson at the time, there is no Negro problem, there is no Southern problem, there is no Northern problem, there is only an American problem and we are met here tonight as Americans, not as Democrats or Republicans, we are met here as Americans to solve that problem. 1965, IBM also launched their uh, Systems 360, which Tom Watson uh, basically said was their crowning achievement uh, to that point. Uh, the two milestones with the new machine were basically that it was uh, faster, had more processing power. Uh, it was also the most flexible machine. That is, this machine and system was now able to talk to other IBM machines, both older and the, those that might come after. And so built in a flexibility to think about uh, processing systems, data processing systems, uh, across times, across machinery, across uh, digital and uh, geographical space. Talking about their facility in Armonk, he said, Tom Watson, that is part of a worldwide network of IBM centers developing the step-by-step -step programs which handle or enable the System 360 to solve a vast range of complex problems. And so as you can expect here, what I'm really thinking and homing in on here is this idea about problems, about, I, uh, about IBM, that as it's uh, making its way as pretty much the only game in town in computing at this time, uh, frames itself as a problem-solving company, its machines as problem-solving technologies. Uh, what happens then when you are the biggest problem around? And so I want to end with uh, just reminding you of a quote that some of you may be familiar with that opens up W.E.B. Du Bois's Souls of Black Folk. He says, between me and the other world, there is ever an unasked question, unasked by some through feelings of delicacy, by others through the difficulty of rightly framing it. All nevertheless flutter around it. They approach me in a half-hesitant sort of way, I me curiously, or compassionately, and then instead of saying directly, how does it feel to be a problem, they say, I know an excellent colored man in my town, or I fought at Mechanicsville, or do not these southern outrages make your blood boil? At these I smile, or I'm interested, or reduce the boiling to a simmer, as the occasion may require. To the real question, how does it feel to be a problem, I answer seldom a word. And so I want to end with saying that uh, putting out an answer to Du Bois's question, how does it feel to be a problem, in the context of, uh, of, of computing, that to be a persistent problem always means that you become the object of anything <coughs> and everything that advertises or holds itself out as a solution, right? Um, and so this then becoming that formative ground, that foundation for what becomes this enduring uh, relationship. Uh, and I think what is uh, most interesting and what I really focus on in the early part of the book is that um, in the <coughs> early 60s and almost perfected by the end of the 60s, you have computing that has attached itself to all of these differing institutions who have similar institutional problems, all of them that focus on African Americans and uh, race in some significant way. And so when we think about profiling, predictive policing, uh, credit scoring, all these different ways that uh, computing and now the internet has been drawn into facilitating racial discrimination, all of these things began itself as a very deliberate 
uh, marriage between issues of race and uh, computing. I will stop there. Thank you. Sorry, I went a bit over, but please, any questions, comments that you uh, have? Yes. Oh, thank you so much, by the way. I'm doing, thank I'm you. finishing my PhD here at the OI right now on P-TECH. Are you familiar with P-TECH? I am. Started by IBM, and it's interesting you bring up them as problem solvers because the, the executives I talked to at IBM who were on the steering committee for it as well touted P-TECH as solving issues for social mobility issues for you know, uh, underrepresented groups. Mm -hmm. When I asked about what kind of jobs are these students going to get, it was very similar to what you said, not so much innovation side, not so much. And then I said, so where's the social mobility coming in? Like how is that being solved and digital inequalities in general? Mm. But what I'm curious about is did William, or maybe if you talk to anybody else at IBM, did they have this sense of optimism that working for IBM that they would, like this was solving a problem? in that way? They, they, they very <laughs> much did. Uh, so these were folks that were all kind of right. in that digital optimism stream because this was something that they knew mm -hmm. that very few people like them did. Uh, and so they played both the role as kind of pioneer but as evangelist as well. And so there's that story that runs okay. through trying to get other people um, and it fits with, you know, hey, here's a new avenue for potential economic development for African Americans. There was this sense of, uh, here's a ticket to mobility. Uh, if you learn the system, if you uh, learn the rules, one guy I talked to was like, I just felt like I had to go through every single manual and read every single thing because I wanted to master the machine, as it were. Right? Um, so yeah, they were very much uh, digital optimists. And, uh, interesting about P-TECH, this strategy you, you, they talk about in reference uh, was part of a very old, you probably know this, strategy uh, around what they call sort of a supply side part of, uh, of this. That is, we build people to work at IBM, mm -hmm. basically. Mm -hmm. Not to build new machines or to tell us what we're doing wrong. We want people that will work at IBM. Yeah, so very much. Indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Um, so I'm, I'm curious about, um, I've been reading a lot, lot about black Twitter and how there's a much higher percentage of African Americans on Twitter as compared to white Americans, and even in terms of their activity online, um, they're more likely to like, to retweet, and there's this real sense of community online that seems like can be traced back um, in the examples that you've given as well. Um, are, are there any reasons that you've come up with, with why there was that inherent sense of community um, that's still endured with mm. the black community specifically online? Yeah, it's a great uh, question. Um, I think the, the gap <laughs> between the end of the, uh, the civil rights movement in the late 60s and this moment, um, the early, mid 80s into the 90s and so forth, Political scientists at the time were talking about how there was a sort of disappearance of the black public sphere. That black people had no way to really organize, to be together. There's no sense of a shared community or set of interests. That all those things dissipated as the sort of protest activity post-68 uh, um, really began uh, to wane. Um, and so I think what the internet really did, um, and seeing these precursors with uh, the Afronet, was it, it just became a place to connect, right? So there just seems to be this underlying sense that if we're going to move anything forward as a collective, we've got to be together. We've got to be connected <laughs> in some way. Um, and that's hard to do if I'm simply bounded to my ge geographical uh, area, and that's what I know, and I have very little mobility, perhaps hard to talk to others in all these places if I don't have the resources to do so, or uh, the positions where I have the flexibility and freedom. Um, and so I think the internet really picks up on this um, and gives people an opportunity to say, I connect to my, my people here in Newark at my barber shop, at the hair salon, at church, but that's still 
very limited. When I have this thing now and I can connect to someone in Los Angeles and I'm in Charlotte, North Carolina on the East Coast, this is great. And the, I think the, the interesting thing about those early networking, even sort of up into the mid uh, 90s and so forth, people didn't seem to, at least the ones that I've talked to and looking at the sort of content around at that time, there wasn't this explicit like, here's a tool for activism and I wanna lose this to sort of further all of these kinds of uh, uh, things that would help push racial equality. It was really, I just want to be together with other black people, mm -hmm. right? And people on the Afronet, when you look at the chat logs and so forth, everything that you can think of that brings people together, right? Entertainers, the opposite sex, <laughs> the same sex, um, anything having to do with sex, <laughs> um, pretty much all of that, right? That's the stuff that people like. Gossip, you're talking about people, church, religion, all of those things that are just the stuff of everyday life that people bond around. And so is that central aspect about community. And my suspicion um, is that uh, this is what fuels uh, your black Twitter uh, and these other kind of online uh, networks. That it is, it facilitates that stuff of everyday life that simply keeps us connected, even as, um, you know, maybe one is a, for a political agenda or maybe it emerges out of political agenda in a particular moment, but it's mostly about connecting. Mm -hmm. Yes. I'm gonna jump in. If, sure? Okay. Um, because this is just to follow up on that idea of connecting. I'm sure you've heard the phrase from um, John Seeley Brown and Paul DeGood of the information hammer, right? Mm. Once you have information, it goes around looking for the problem. And that seemed really clear from the, from the second half of your talk. And I, uh, what, I, what I like about putting IBM in the center is that, you know, IBM has all of these interesting racial politics and are implicated mm. in much bigger mm -hmm. narratives around um, surveillance state and classification and racial mm. ordering mm -hmm. that even predate 1968. So, right. you know, this idea of informa the information hammer being used for control is, is, is earlier than even IBM, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, but there's, there is this nice tension in the two halves of your talk that, you know, that the, this, I, I guess I kept thinking, coming back back to what happened to the social capital built by that first generation of entrepreneurs. Mm. And, you know, surely there's <clears throat> something going on before Twitter. Um, is there some kind of story there, um, you know, yeah, there is a story, and it's very much tied to sort of the original one that begins in 1965, and this is very much the sort of the, the through narrative, which is if you form a relationship that says here is the limits mm -hmm. of black people and black people's dealings, achievements, etc. here's a floor, but here's a ceiling, mm -hmm. right? Um, that that carries through in every instantiation mm -hmm. of activity or new technology, right? So the story I didn't tell about that group of entrepreneurs um, was that the, the way I ended up making my way through most of them was because I talked to Derek and David first. Mm -hmm. I talked to Derek, talked to David, I talked to Derek some more, talked to David some mm -hmm. more. Um, after the first couple of times, well, in my talking with Derek, he talked about this moment. He said, there was a time in 1996, I went to uh, the Congressional Black Caucus, uh, which is a group of uh, African-American legislators um, in the federal government in the U.S. They sponsor a, an annual legislative conference. Uh, so they had invited me, uh, he said, there uh, to talk about 
new technology and cyberspace and the new information highway. Um, and he said, it was the worst weekend of my life. Mm. And I said, really? Why? And he started off with saying, well, that Saturday night, Tupac was shot. So that came the day before. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe that sort of set the mood. Um, but essentially what he said was, we were all in this room. People like me and a lot of people not like me. All of them black, all of them internet pioneers in some way. But we were all there for very different reasons. And the ones that were hardcore entrepreneurs like David, David was like, you know what? The best way I could figure out to do for my community was to do for myself. I was trying to make money, plain and simple. Um, and he built an empire that ultimately he sold to AOL for uh, $5 million. Uh, actually, a little bit more than that, I think. Um, but so there was, there was that moment. They were all there. And essentially in a room. And I asked Derek a little bit later after talking to David, I said, do you know a guy named David Ellington? And he said, <sighs> and I was like, okay, tell me more. <laughs> and he basically said, you know, after you first uh, contacted me uh, about this, he said my first email I sent to David Ellington because for 20 years now, there's been a lot of bad blood that we've never kind of, uh, um, rectified or uh, paid attention to. And they were in many ways, you know, that was who Derek was talking about in terms of being in that room and being the worst day of his, of his life, the people that were jockeying for position. Mm -hmm. And what you could tell by that very gathering that you essentially have everybody who's doing anything that's black in technology at that time is there's only going to be so far that you folks are going to be able to do, right? Mm -hmm. So let's get our one shot and let's make it a good shot. Let's get all of you in the room. We're going to figure out what the approach is, who's going where, who's going to be doing what. Um, and so one could see very clearly that there was a, sort, a sense of optimism, but also a sense of very clear limitation. Mm -hmm. um, and that sort of pervaded uh, that conversation. And I think, um, you know, so at, at all of these folks ended in that same way because, you know, they sold. There were bigger companies that were basically, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take what you have. I'm happy to pay you for it, but eventually I'm going to take it anyway. So what do you do? Um, William Morrell was also later part of a, um, a, that Afronet community that CompuServe had approached and said, can we turn you into our <coughs> CompuServe version of Net Noir? And the Afronet folks said, nope. Mm -hmm. um, actually, they said, yes, if we will do all of it and you stay out. And they, of course, said, no, no we don't like that. Uh, so they said, no. And they built something. It didn't last for long, and then it went away. Um, and that's pretty much the story of uh, pretty, all of those folks. And then people who then begin to try to do new things hit that ceiling very early, many before they're able to even sort of begin. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, so there's uh, Interactive One, which is probably the, they may still be black owned, I'm not sure about that. Um, but they may be the sole black owned um, internet media company that sort of still persists. Um, but the others all go away. The price of the ticket is too high at this point for most. Yes. Um, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to phrase this question very well. It's all right. Uh, I'm going to take a go at it. But kind of, um, also, it's because my, my actual question was already taken. <laughs> why, uh, why black Twitter and maybe not black uh, Reddit or black Facebook. Mm. But, uh, but anyway, I have a question about uh, imagination. You're talking about limits, and obviously there's a notion of like a, a ceiling. I'm not sure if you call it glass. Um, and next week, to be too trivial, Black Panther comes out. Mm. And it's a story that is unabashedly about inspiring is sort of like, this is like really, we're really technologically advanced. We just didn't mm. want to tell anybody about this because we knew you'd come in and try <laughs> to mess with it. Right. Uh, and it's, 
it's not seen as black exploitation. It's not seen as like trying to give anything. It's just trying to build a narrative, uh, of ideally an inspirational ones, black director, black actors, black writer, etc. Based on Ta Nehisi Coates's uh, mm -hmm. um, original stories and that sort of thing. Anyway, the point yeah. being, do you think cultural artifacts like that? help to move the needle in terms of expectations of representation? Or are they more uh, just like Marvel just rolling it all in, just taking a bunch of mm. Black Lives Matter tension and saying, yeah, we'll make a movie about mm. it. Um, and I ask because this, this representational issue is one that kind of goes back and forth. You're at one point trying to say, here's um, bunch of black entrepreneurs, um, black figures, and on the other, we have issues of digital divide and lack of representation, and they seem to come together to create this limit, and I'm trying yeah. to think in my head, what puts into people's heads something that pushes beyond that limit, and are cultural things this, or is it something else? Does it have to be from the bottom yeah. up? Yeah, it's good. Um, <clears throat> it's a good question. I think that all of those things are, are uh, a factor. That is, I think the cultural pushes both the representational but also what we might call the the political mm. um, and in some ways I think that many black people in terms of their relationship with technology the internet and so forth have made their peace with I'm going to take what is available and use that to the these purposes for which it was not necessarily uh, mm. oriented Right, so I'm going to use Twitter to do the work of Black Lives Matter, and Twitter will own it. They will own everything and control access and everything that's possible within the environment. But I will exploit it to the best of my ability for my uh, the the sort of racial purposes, purposes of the community. Um, I think it's the same way when we talk about Black Panther and so forth. These are uh, people who even wrapped in sort of the the big company within Marvel with others that are could be said to be exploiting uh, many of these things, using it to push the envelope. Um, and I think in many ways that group that I talked about in sort of the, the early 90s, uh, this was basically the same thread and connection. Those who said, we should be using this for this and this only. And others that were like, I just want to get people gossiping about mm -hmm. other black people, right? Well, part of my question stems from like a kind of a gap in the 80s. Mm. And I was like, but in the 80s, that's when you have Afrofuturism and that's yep. when you have repurposing yep. a tech for right. hip hop. And like, yeah. you, I think you kind of nailed it there. The one re thread is we're going to repurpose it for our own ends right. and <laughs> we're not going to ask permission. Yeah, exactly. And that, I mean, that's been. That's been, I think, the history of black people. I think it's been the history of marginalized groups uh, uh, in general. That is, to the degree that we can invent and create, we will. Um, to the degree that we can uh, repurpose, repurpose other tools, environments, etc., uh, we will. And we will basically, you know, kind of like the, what's the game where you hit the whack-a-mole, um, you know, any opening that you give us to exploit, we will do so. N even as we tried for that, you know, to be at the top of that ceiling and push that ceiling ever upwards, uh, working at all ranges uh, within that. Um, and so I think, you know, the Afrofuturism that you bring up, uh, hip hop, all of those, I think, uh, feed into, and there are some other connections in those things to uh, the uh, the rise of the internet and so forth, and the black internet, as it were, uh, of course. But all around that sort of thread of this is this is cultural work that looks very differently, and at cer certain times mobilizes its, its, itself as political work. So we're not seeing that, and we're not seeing these people on the street throughout the '80s. But that's part of my point about Black Lives Matter. When we begin to see what seems to be new for many other people, um, this was just the moment to strike, right? The prepar preparation has been long a part of the cultural work. And this was the moment to seize and seize in this way.
Um, I wanted to pick, on some, pick up on something you mentioned about kind of studying history from specific trajectories <laughs> and how maybe we've done that with the internet in, in looking at maybe universities as kind of bodies of knowledge and, and inventors and all that side of things, right. which I found really interesting. Um, and I, I come from kind of a historical background an undergrad and so now looking at the internet, I've kind of struggled to join these up a little bit because mm -hmm. I feel like it's something that's missing in what we do. And I think about maybe looking at the OII specifically, I mean, we touch on, from within the master's program, we touch on internet history within some of our core modules, but we do it from this very institutional perspective, mm -hmm. and it is this fact we're trying to fit so much in and being interdisciplinary, there's only so much time to do things, right. and that I think there's balance in that recognition. But I feel like maybe something that we miss from our teaching is this historical perspective, and I think about when we look at our option papers, you, know, you can study the internet from you know, a philosophy perspective, from an economic mm -hmm. perspective, from all of these different angles, but history is missing from that view. And mm. I was just wondering if you could maybe kind of comment on what you think the value of this historical perspective of looking at the internet is. Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, I do, I, mean, I agree with you that it's missing, and largely it's, I think it's about the point of view, right? Mm -hmm. That's where, so where do you begin? I think the disjuncture here is, much of the internet history is about inventors. Who invented the technology? Where did it all come from? Uh, all very fascinating and interesting stories. But if that's where your gaze is, you're only going to get so much. Um, the other is thinking about people, individual people, and that, of course, fits in with that kind of uh, focusing on inventors or focusing on uh, the machine or the technology specifically then you arrive in a similarly kind of narrow story. Um, when you make the jump to uh, users, and I'm forgetting the name of the person now, Phil and Gina, you'll probably both know him, who is at, uh, I think, UVA. Um, Siva. Not Siva. Oh, um, the other one. A, a, uh, a, I'm trying to not say younger scholar. Kevin Driscoll. Yes. Thank you. That's okay. There's um, not many younger scholars <laughs> at UVA. <laughs> um, so, so Kevin, in his dissertation, which I think is now a book by now, um, uh, sort of takes his leap and he looks at these early bulletin board systems and says, look, you miss a whole history of the internet if you're looking at inventors. And you get a different story if you start looking at users. And that begins to open up the field. I think if we take one more leap and sort of say, let's bracket, at least for a moment, the technology altogether and look at groups of people and uh, over this course of a historical trajectory from the origins of computing, the invention, long development of the internet, we began to see these other stories emerge. Um, Tara McPherson, um, in a fairly recent uh, article she wrote, uh, which was one of the first to kind of talk about this um, interaction between computing and civil rights. And what she argued there was essentially two things are happening in parallel in the early 1960s. And she basically <coughs> says, you know, these arguments <coughs> in uh, computing are happening at MIT and Bell Labs and all these kinds of things. And then on the other side of the street, this whole civil rights protest and so forth. Um, and the linkage is only metaphorical in her argument. They're happening concurrently, but no one has really a cross uh, interest. There's no cross section or intersection between the two. Um, and much of the argument that I make in my book is that those two things are not disconnected, that they're wholly part of the same story. Um, and then you end up with some of this story that I'm trying to, to tell. I got some. All right. So I, I don't have a sense of how fast politics happens when, when you look at a, when a platform rolls out. And I guess I, I tend to look for politics. But I noticed mm -hmm. in the list of balloon board uh, BBS numbers, there were two Nation of Islam um, dialogues. Mm -hmm. And you've sort of said that some of the platforms, uh, some of the platforms, some of the sites developed as cultural, you know, about capturing culture and gossip, mm -hmm. and then others seem to be pretty quickly about organizing. Mm -hmm. um, looking over this long, long period, would you say that 
each of the platforms rolls out with some politics in it instantly? Would you buy the theory that you can't build technology without politics? Or for some of these platforms, actually, it was culture first and then, <coughs> then politics? Yeah, that's an interesting question. So I'll answer it in two ways. Um, and that is to say yes to both questions, right? Um, <coughs> As I talk to all of the folks that were connected to these sites, and I say, let me just interject with you know something about politics that was this part of your site. They almost kind of pause as if like, I'll answer this question because it seems like you want me to tell you something, but this is really not it. Like this was not a part of, this was cultural, it's community. Um, it had a lot with sort of bridging uh, knowledge, correct knowledge about representation. Um, so for many, that was, it was purely that. Uh, and I would say by and large, um, uh, for at least the, the high, highly sort of visible of these, it's mostly cultural. Um, and it's the sort of just the stuff of everyday life that I wanna facilitate and facilitate that connection. Um, that said, I think you cannot, in the context of U.S. Uh, sort of racial history and everything else, not say that that very step of traversing uh, a line, as it were, is not in and of itself a political moment, right? To take my, to take my expertise gained from my employer or maybe by my uh, government and then say, I'm gonna use this to connect other black people, even if that's where I stop. Um, <coughs> others know, right? Part of what happens in the Watch Riot and any riot is we just want to not have you all together in the same place. To keep you disconnected is to keep you disempowered, right? So, so I would say, you know, even if folks are not sort of uh, articulating or framing what they do as political, it is very much political. And I see it as very much a political um, move and essentially uh, something that is almost a kind of necessary condition. It's hard, it's hard for me knowing what I know now to see Black Lives Matter happening today had none of that uh, the stuff that had come before not been there. Does that sort of answer the question? Yeah. Any other? Yes, sir. Um, so when, when Wine was shut down by Twitter, a lot of the users talked about how Twitter let down its uh, black user base because it was very popular among them. So I'm wondering if next parallel to this history of reusing and repurposing for users, there is also a parallel history of big tech companies fighting against some of this reusing and repurposing to stopping their platform becoming a space where, as, as we talked earlier about like black Twitter, that mm. a bigger proportion of the black population being there of the white population. Yeah, um, so I mean, I think the, the corollaries as we move sort of through the history of um, sort of black culture production and then the internet is, you know, if we think just about things like copyright, right, that becomes a powerful vehicle for black, black political production where you see this always sort of historically intervening. This is your work, but I'm making money from it and, um, you know, essentially you work for me and this whole uh, area that I've introduced you to in terms of your fame, your popularity, all the ways that you make money exists because I provide it for you. And it's foreclosed once you say, I don't want to make any more money for you. Um, <clears throat> there have been, um, I'm, I'm hard pressed to think of other platforms, uh, specifically sort of like Twitter that have acted in this way. Um, but you begin, I mean, with all of these, it's sort of the dawn of seeing those foreclosure moments uh, all around, both within uh, the company. And so Vine, you know, is one good representation that, you know, this becomes not, or it was becoming not just a cultural space, 
people were beginning to use Vine as an entrepreneurial space, right? Um, for visibility, a lot of freelancers, comics, those kinds of things, entertainers. Um, so, you know, it may be that uh, that was the sort of defining moment in the kind of internet in the digital age of here we start to see a collective group uh, pushing and defining the boundaries of a technology that we have an interest in curtailing. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, with the click of a button, that happens very easily. Um, and that's part of that sort of ceiling, you know, that I talk about, you know, when, when things become too dangerous, when, you know, this is the geographical politics that play out and have played out for years and years, when there become too, mo too many of you in my space, it's time for me to reclaim my space. Uh, that means either doing something differently with the space or moving you out of it, um, and often both, right? Um, and I think this is in large part what's happening with, with those. And I would expect and suspect that that becomes what we see much more in the future and what sort of fuels this kind of uh, pessimism for me, which is that, you know, as soon as we exploit this, if I do not control, if I do not own, then I'm always at the mercy of someone else who doesn't have my overarching interest. Yes? Uh, we have seen many political movements and social movements all over the world that has died, basically. They started, and then like a few months later, we never hated them again. But Black Lives Matter continued for a really long time. And why do you think it survived for that long? And do you think we're going to move from activism to pacifism, or like people won't be affected and go to the street actually uh, mm -hmm. by Twitter um, hashtags Black Lives Matter, yeah. or we're going to end like for activism to slacktivism, or we're going to end up with pacifism at the end? Yeah. <laughs> it's a lot of isms. <laughs> it's a, it's a, <laughs> a lot of isms. That's what we're going to end up with. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, that's the. The question, I mean, so the, to the first part, I think Black Lives Matter exploited a moment um, in the ways that many other uh, movements had. That is, um, <clears throat> you know, when the, when the hashtag was first created, of course, was long before any of us knew about Black Lives Matter. This was, you know, right after Trayvon Martin and uh, the acquittal of um, the guy who killed him. Um, but it wasn't until sort of midway into Ferguson that Black Lives Matter really begins to sort of come on the scene and then persist. Um, and so I think it had a lot to do with the luck and the network formations that were able to form in that moment, primarily because a lot of the groundwork had already been laid by uh, uh, the three uh, young women that began Black Lives Matter who uh, you know, when I, when I speak to them and talk to them about sort of internet activism, you know, are ready to sh shoot me through the heart because they're like, the internet doesn't have anything to do with this, right? This is a tool we exploit, but this is about organizing. Our work is about organizing. We are in places with people, training people uh, to do this work. Um, and so I think that too then, um, relates to the, the second question um, and maybe even challenging the notion about uh, Black Lives Matter and maybe even some of these other movements disappearing. Um, I mean, certainly the visibility isn't what it was. Um, and certainly there are folks, and I'm one included, that will say 10 years from now, no one will be saying Black Lives Matter. Um, <clears throat> And, you know, and that will be controversial to some and to others uh, not. I think these movements operate within a political framework um, and, and exploit the technology and exploit the uh, digital component of it when it becomes useful um, and when it has a role to play. But I think if you'd ask many involved in uh, the Black Lives Matter movement today, what they say is, yeah, you don't see us on Twitter, and that's kind of a good thing 
because everything that we were doing on Twitter, number one, wasn't good, um, or facilitating what we wanted to happen. But number two, we're putting our energies where they need to be. That is, with people in local communities that have connection to local centers of government and power, and that's gonna be the way to push the persistent change. Um, and so I think in the same way that they see sort of the internet as ancillary to their goals as a mere tool, um, those who are seriously about the movement are saying our ends were never really about building up this internet thing, right? So even if we are now invisible on Twitter, that says little about who we are and about our uh, success. Um, that said, I think that we will continue to fight with what does success look like, right? What does it mean? And does, does the sort of burgeoning internet activity allow me to say when something is alive or dead? Or is there a different barometer when we talk about boots on the ground, as it were, people in the street, um, protest, actual bodies showing up in physical spaces and doing things? And I think those are always at tension. Um, and I'll end the question, the answer to the question with uh, this sort of interesting conversation with two, with uh, Dre McKesson that many of you may be familiar with in terms of Black Lives Matter, um, a woman named Dream Hampton who is uh, an artist, activist, um, uh, I'm not gonna say older, my generation, um, I will say, which is not older, <laughs> just a different generation. Um, <clears throat> She really helped put this in perspective because she sort of straddles generations. And I'll skip over a whole lot of kind of uh, Twitter nonsense um, and fighting. But she said, you know, when Ferguson happened <clears throat> and she showed up, right? She had had years of organizing. She counted as her mentors, people that were Black Panthers, people that were part of uh, the Black Arts Movement, uh, Amir Baraka, <coughs> uh, many of these uh, folks. She said, DeRay showed up and had no experience whatsoever between that point, um, but he had a mobile phone and he had a Twitter following and he has become the leader of this movement by virtue of that. Um, and you can sort of see this playing out. Um, and so I think that becomes part of the new tension. That is, how do we best move forward? Is it about a kind of a revolutionary moment that looks closer to that opening scene in Watts or that scene in Ferguson than it does with all of us chatting over Twitter or Facebook and so forth in this, in this room. So. Thank you. Oh, was one more? Yeah. Oh, I, I, I have a question. Quick. Quick. Yeah. The, the early hacker community distinguished itself in part from the mainstream through um, anti-racist ideology. So mm. an example of that is in the magazine Pratt, there's a hacker manifesto published in the mid-80s. Mid so it can, contains the line, um, we, we exist without nationality, without religious bias, without mm. skin coloring, and you mm. call us criminals. So my question is if um, any, of the, any of that ideology translated into participation of black people in the hacker community or the use of hacking mm. to advance uh, civil rights. Mm. It's a great question, and it's, um, it's a history I'm not familiar with. Um, I can't, even as you throw out that example, I can't imagine that that is um, unique. Um, and I think in some real ways, when we think about hacking uh, in the general sense, this is what people, particularly in that uh, uh, the 80s moment, were doing. Black people that were uh, online, that were um, connected to uh, uh, digital technology in some way, uh, they were uh, hacking, but I have not gone down specifically uh, that road, though there seemed to be uh, that element. And those elements come through, uh, I think mostly, uh, as you mentioned, in those magazines, which I've, I've scoured and have sort of 
um, at some point just purposefully said, I can't go here. <laughs> uh, I can't chase the rabbit uh, down, the, down the hole. Um, but that would be a fascinating story where I'm sure there is probably a story of like-minded allies at that moment. Thank you. Thank you.